Our next speaker is Joni Ikonen. Joni is a PhD student in a QCD group. And Joni is telling us about qubit measurement by multi-channel driving. Right. So, yeah, I'm uh, here representing the quantum computing and devices group. And as you might guess from the title, it's uh, might be a little more technical than the previous ones, but bear with me. So um, when I think about the development of quantum computers, I this is something I have in my mind. So it's a bit like the Penrose stairs. It, the quantum computer promises to do something which is kind of impossible in a sense, or so it appears. And but you also you need all the pieces to make it work. So if one one of these pieces of the quantum computer is not there, then it's just a bunch of blocks. Um, so specifically what we need is, of course, we need to store the quantum of information for a long time. We need uh, to precisely control our qubits to do what I we want. Um, we want to measure the qubits very accurately to know the result of the algorithms. Then uh, we of course need uh, a so-called universal gate set to d do, do all these uh, amazing algor quantum algorithms. Um, we also need um, the ability to initialize the qubit states precisely and finally to scale up these designs so that when we add, add more qubits to the computer it doesn't break. And uh, in the QCD group we are developing many of these building blocks. But today I will uh, focus on one of these blocks, our recent uh, research on this uh, precise and fast qubit measurement. So qubit measurement is quite a uh, difficult task because the qubit only holds one excitation. And so the way to measure it, the way people, people use usually measure the state of the qubit, they use um, kind of I uh, an indirect way of measuring it. So we use microwave resonators. And here, um, on the right hand side we ha uh, on or okay so left on the left hand side we have a resonator a mic microwave resonator and the signal that that's uh, leaking out of it and on the right hand side we have what we might uh, see in the software so it's some kind of uh, signal uh, in two dimensional phase space which has uh, some classical and quantum noise in it. But for simplicity we can uh, think that this signal that we see is uh, the quantum distribution of the state that is living inside the resonator. And we, we can uh, coherently drive this resonator by a microwave signal which then results that uh, so that uh, the resonator is filled up with photons which in this phase space looks like this, so that the distribution is moved uh, uh, to a certain point. Okay, so that was for resonators, but we want to measure qubits. So <coughs> uh, the qubit we want to measure is then coupled to the resonator, like this. And here I'm specifically talking about uh, superconducting qubits. Um, so what happens in this case when we apply the same driving signal, uh, the distribution instead uh, curves to a certain direction. And the what's really neat about this is that uh, this behavior in the phase space depends on the state of the qubit. So if instead, here I showed uh, an example where the qubit is in the ground state, but if, if the qubit would be instead in the excited state, then 
the phase will curve in a di different direction. And so just by looking at this uh, signal, we can deduce the state of the qubit. Um, so this is kind of a standard stuff that people use to measure the qubits all the time. But um, what's uh, one drawback of this is this very small uh, part where we have to kind of pump the resonator to be full of uh, photons. And during this time, we can uh, basically extract no useful information about the qubit because the distributions are overlapping. So here is uh, our idea how to get rid of this slow and useless part. Uh, is what we did in this recent paper. So uh, the basically the only difference is that we add, uh, in addition to this normal uh, driving signal, we add this uh, driving signal directly to the qubit. And it has to be in a correct phase and frequency and amplitude. But when you do it correctly, uh, you will see that these distributions instead uh, behave like this. So from the very beginning of the measurement, the distributions start to advance in different directions. And then we can immediately gather some useful information about the qubit state. So here's our experimental setup where we tested this. And um, I'm not going to talk the details about it, but I can uh, shortly say that we used uh, superconducting transmon qubits of the Xmon type. And then here you can see the schematic where we apply these uh, two microwave pulses to this one qubit that we wanted to measure. And here are the res results. So um, first we did some simulations about this. So here uh, on the left we have the typical measurement scheme and on the right we have our multi-channel scheme in comparison. And these uh, curves represent the trajectories of these distributions I showed earlier. Um, and yes, and the arrows are kind of the represent the two microwave tones that we apply. And and here are the experiments. So we can see that these we have a quite nice uh, qualitative agreement between simulation and theory. Um, this is uh, quite sensitive to the uh, to tones that we apply. So we also simulated. Uh, so in this simulation, this one of the tones is slightly uh, non-ideally aligned. And we can al already see that the trajectories uh, change significantly. So probably this uh, our experiment is somewhere between these two uh, simulations. <coughs> so in the end, what we want is to measure the state of the qubit uh, accurately and quickly. So here we have um, uh, the average uh, measurement error as a function of time that it takes to measure the state of the qubit. And uh, we can see that our, our method, which is uh, with the yellow one, is always below the green one, which is the typical way of measuring qubits. Um, which means that you can look at it, at it uh, in two ways. First is that we can already uh, always reach the same uh, fidelity or error in a faster time, which is nice. Uh, or then the other way is that for a given given measurement time, we can say that the typical um, typical measurement scheme is always produces more error. So we should always use our method. 
Um, yeah, so that was that one snapshot of our research in the QCD labs. Uh, other things we do, of course, build uh, uh, because we are part of this quantum computer project. That is a uh, large part of our research, but we also have um, uh, very much about uh, qubit design and fabrication. I think, yes, we have a poster about that here. Um, then we are also have uh, research in bosons and condensates and uh, single electron pumping and spin qubits. Uh, then there's been a lot of work on uh, quantum refrigeration and initialization protocols and of course then uh, microwave barometers which I think we also have a poster about. So that was that. Here's a uh, picture of almost the whole group. Uh, quite a people missing there, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. So the question was: uh, It seems that here the two states are quite easily indistinguishable. Or distinguishable right from the very beginning right but uh, so this uh, these curves are actually the averaged many times to get this uh, so in a single measurement we only see this very big cloud and when they are overlapping here it's very hard to see which one it is until they are separated like this right uh, so the question was do I have uh, graphs which show this behavior in time or as a function of time so well I can show you this so it is this is of course not exactly what you asked but this is directly related to the separation of these two states so the more they separate the easier uh, the or yeah so the bigger the distance the better distinction you can make basically so that's why the error decreases here uh, yeah, so the question was, can we improve this? And I believe and hope that yes, we can. This was our very first sample. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of technical things that we can do to improve it, I hope.